Today I want to talk about something that I don't expect a lot of other channels to follow me down the rabbit hole of, but I think it's important for the kinds of subjects that we're going to be talking about to understand some of the philosophies, and especially how old they are, how much impact they've found themselves having on our realities and our perceptions of reality. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about a man named Maimonides. Rabbi Moshe, son of Maimon, was born in Spain, but lived most of his life in 12th century Egypt. You may know him as Rambam, or Maimonides. Most Jews of his era knew him as Ibn Ovadia, named for Ovadia the patriarch of his family, going back seven generations. Rambam was a world-famous philosopher. To this very day, his Mora Nebuchim, Guide of the Perplexed, which has no less than 83 commentaries, is studied by philosophers and students as a classic work of philosophy. Mi Moshe v'yag Moshe, lo kam ki Moshe. From Moses to Moses, there arose no one like Moses. Indeed, during his lifetime, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon was compared to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses the Torah giver. On the 17th of Nisan, 4898, according to the Hebrew calendar, 1138 in the Gregorian. Jews in the southern Spanish city of Cordoba were preparing for Passover, the festival of deliverance, but the household of the esteemed rabbinical judge of Cordoba, Rabbi Maimonides, was celebrating a delivery of another kind. Just one day shy of Passover, the rabbi and his wife welcomed their eldest son, whom they named Moshe, Hebrew for Moses. in a systemic, clear, and concise fashion. The 14-volume masterpiece created a powerful impression across the Jewish world. Then, in 1177, tragedy struck. Maimonides' brother David drowned when his ship, fully laden with merchandise, sunk in the Indian Ocean. The brothers had shared a deep bond, and Maimonides grieved terribly for years. David had also been Maimonides' business partner, and this calamity meant financial ruination for Maimonides, who was now forced to become a doctor. 
His expertise soon caught the attention of the Egyptian ruler Sultan, Saladin, who appointed Maimonides to the position of royal physician. Maimonides also served as the leader of the Egyptian Jewry. He juggled his time between his royal duties, treating private patients serving as a statesman for the Jewish community, teaching Torah, and discussing medicine, philosophy, and science with his non-Jewish audiences. Maimonides described his schedule in a letter to the dear student rabbi Samuel Ibn Dumond of Provence. I live in Falstadt, and the Sultan lives in Cairo. I must see him every morning to check on his health. As a rule, I am in Cairo early each day, and even if nothing unusual happens, by the time I get back to Falstadt, half the day is gone. When I come home, my foyer is always full of people, Jews and non-Jews, important people and not important people, judges and politicians, and policemen. I apologize and ask that they should be kind enough to give me a few minutes to eat. This is the only meal I take in 24 hours. Patients go in and out until nightfall, and sometimes I swear to you by the Torah, it is two hours into the night before they are gone. I talk to them and prescribe for them, even while lying down on my back from exhaustion. On Shabbat, the whole congregation, or at least the majority of it, comes to my house after morning service, and I instruct the members of the community as to what they should do during the entire week. We learn together in a week fashion until the afternoon. This is my schedule. Maimonides' quill hardly saw any rest either. Jewish communities from different lands sought his advice and rulings on Jewish law as well, and Maimonides felt compelled to pen yet another literary masterpiece to forestall a developing crisis in Jewish faith. Many Jewish scholars in the Arabic lands had been swept up in the newfound Islamic obsession with Greek philosophy. This left some Jewish scholars deeply disturbed by the apparent intellectual contradictions between contemporary Greco-Islamic philosophy and various precepts of the Torah. Maimonides published a treatise that thoroughly addressed these issues from a philosophical standpoint under the title Guide for the Perplexed. When Maimonides passed away in 1204, the entire Jewish world mourned his passing. An epitaph without historical parallel was carved into his gravestone, proclaiming that since the days of Moses, no Jewish leader's achievements had rivaled that of Moses Maimonides. And yet, just 30 years after his death, Maimonides and some of his works became the subject of bitter controversy in the wider Jewish community. At the height of the dispute, some Jews slandered Maimonides' books to Christian religious authorities who burned them as heretical works. Maimonides' son and his successor as leaders of the Cairo Jewish community Rabbi Avraham penned the poem to mourn the burning of his father's sacred texts. How foolish are they to believe that with fire one can destroy books more precious than gold. These books are themselves consuming fire. How then then can they perish in the flames? Know you who burn in your arrogant helpers. All is not as it appears. They went up like Elijah to God and as an angel into the flame. How could one of Judaism's greatest scholars become the source of such extreme dispute? What lay at the heart of Maimonides' debate? And how does this great debate of the 13th century continue to influence us today? The Jews of Yemen held him in such high regard that they prayed for him every time they said Kaddish. Rambam was referred to as Michar Chachan Ushi, the best of mankind. Rambam was the personal trusted physician of the powerful emperor and warrior Saladin of Egypt. In fact, some of Rambam's medical books were written exclusively for the royal family. Today, over 900 years since his birth, there are hospitals and schools such as Maimonides in Brooklyn, even stamps and currency honoring Rambam, Maimonides. Perhaps it is Rambam's series of 14 books that took him a decade to write that his most significant contribution. He named it Mishnah Torah, meaning second to the Torah, the Torah of Moses. Unlike all of his other works written in Arabic, Mishnah Torah was written in Hebrew. In his introduction, 
Rambam promised those who learned his work, study the Torah of Moses, and then study my Mishnah Torah, and you will be fluent in Jewish law. But did this amazing work gain the popularity it rightly deserved? Not entirely. At least not in the way Rambam envisioned it would. So in order to promote learning of Mishnah Torah, Jewish leaders came up with some very creative ideas. For example, several years after Rambam, Rabbi Tachum Hayyurashalmi wrote a Hebrew-Arabic Mishnah Torah dictionary to assist Middle Eastern Jews who were not very familiar with the Hebrew language in understanding Maimonides. Another resourceful Sephardic rabbi from Turkey in the 17th century by the name of Shlomo ibn Mukhar noticed how people were more interested in songs and poetry than studying the Mishnah Torah. And so Shlomo rearranged the words of the entire Mishnah Torah, thus transforming it into an incredible blend of song and poetry. Shortly after the introduction of the Gutenberg printing press, the Jews of Italy published a sort of Kitzer Mishnah Torah, an abridged version. This single volume made it affordable and accessible for every Jew to study on a regular basis, sort of a Martin Luther for the Italian Jews of his time. But this was only for the Jews of Italy. Despite all the efforts to popularize it, for the past 800 years, the Mishnah Torah has been used mainly as a reference book, a starting point for the hair-splitting analysis of the wisest Talmudic scholars. But the Mishnah Torah is a lot more than that. It covers every aspect of life and Jewish life, from morning to evening, from India to Indianapolis to Israel, from birth till death. The prolific Rambam combined the entire corpus of Jewish literature and arranged the laws in a perfectly organized system. Everything was there, and everything had its place. If a Jew had a question in the halacha, Jewish law, he only needed to open the appropriate section and quickly find his answer. Before 1524, this was unheard of. Although, the accepted contemporary halacha does not always follow the ruling of the Mishnah Torah. Learning it provides every Jew with an amazing opportunity to learn kol ha-Torah kula, the entire Torah, even the laws of the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. To facilitate learning all of the laws of the Torah, in 1984, the Lubavitcher Rebbe initiated a campaign for every Jew to learn Mishnah Torah on a daily basis. So, that is how pervasive Maimonides has become. We have traditions for everything. How to sleep, how to eat, how to work. How to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. And because of our tradition, every one of us knows who he is and what God expects us to do. And as Maimonides said, and the world will be filled with the knowledge of God, like the sea is covered with water. Things that you never heard before, and now we're about to get into a conversation that you never heard before. On Reese's or Darion, yeah, Reese's or Darion.